it has been quite a life journey, but uh, I was open for the adventure. If you want to be super successful, you have to drop out. I was also exposed to the environment that inspired Wasoka. Dad and mom have uh, given birth to a ocean of curiosity in your case. I think there was a huge amount of ignorance and misunderstanding around the Middle East, using my skills to actually build out systems, solutions that could actually help. You're considering buying another company in Nigeria. The merger process overall has been uh, extraordinarily educational. Could you imagine in 2012 that in 2024, you'd be coming back to Egypt. You know, the more a place seems to be misunderstood, the more curious I am. Welcome in the Valley. I'm your host today, and my name is Ibrahim Sanya. We have an amazing show today, but before that, a gentle reminder. Press that subscribe button. Join the community of funders and founders, changing sports, tech, entertainment, and fashion from Africa to the rest of the world. And never miss a thing. Enjoy the show. Daniel. Ibrahim. So good to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Cairo, out of all places. Out of all places. So your journey is one a very interesting one. You actually learn Arabic and speak more than five languages. What's the exact number? Uh, around seven. Seven. And it's in the round. So I'm sure there's more in store. So you learn Arabic in Egypt, in which year? This would have been back in 2012. 2012. Could you imagine in 2012 that in 2024, you'd be coming back to Egypt to merge with the largest e-commerce player in the country and have now an office here? Absolutely not. This is beyond my wildest uh, imagination. So it's, uh, it's a complete, uh, absolute delight to be back in the country, actually the first uh, country that I ever visited in Africa. Uh, so really, it's been a full circle adventure. And you have a even more intriguing story because I think one of the first countries you have been visiting after Cairo was Kenya. And I hear you even was in a music band. So before we go into your many adventures in the African continent, let's tap into all the key elements, all the key dots that prepared you to be this lucky and successful at the young age of 31. Absolutely ready for it. So let's go as far back as you in California, your parents, and how do you migrate from California to New England and find yourself at Exeter, the school where Mark Zuckerberg came from and where you've been a great mentor to my own daughter who's going there now and who's been just interning with you guys. So thank you. Uh, big thank you for that. She's loved the experience. But tell me about that journey from LA, knowing that your parents were not necessarily born in LA either. Absolutely. It has been quite a uh, life journey. So as you mentioned, I was born and raised in Southern California. Uh, so about an hour outside of LA, you know, typical suburban home life. Um, though my family has uh, very different backgrounds, my, my two parents. So uh, my mother is originally from Peoria, Illinois, so about as Midwestern as, uh, as you can get, um, though my father uh, is from Hong Kong, uh, so born and raised and uh, left Hong Kong uh, for, for school, actually initially immigrated to Canada, uh, where he, he did his studies uh, to become a medical doctor, and then from there uh, moved uh, to California, where he met my mother, who had actually... Uh, actually just moved there uh, working as a pharmacist. Mm. Uh, so they met uh, overlapping uh, on their hospital shifts uh, and uh, eventually settled down. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the firstborn, so the, uh, the eldest son, uh, which uh, in a lot of cultures, definitely in Chinese culture, is, uh, 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 has extra responsibilities and expectations. I'm one myself, I know. Uh, exactly. we'll call it the white mouse. Ah, yes. They, they try everything on you. Absolutely, absolutely. So... 
Um, you know, I think there was a lot, uh, you know, that uh, was definitely expected of me growing up, obviously very, um, uh, very uh, kind of strict, uh, high expectations when it came to the academics. Um, I was uh, always uh, quite good at, at, at maths uh, and uh, other uh, uh, subjects around that and uh, was pushed uh, kind of uh, quite hard on that. I ended up actually skipping a few grades uh, for uh, math specifically. And uh, when I got to uh, the end of my public high school curriculum, I was doing uh, uh, kind of calculus two uh, by, uh, by my sophomore year, um, I was kind of looking for options in terms of, okay, how do I continue to uh, learn more and, and grow, you know, before, uh, you know, ultimately heading off uh, to, to university. And uh, I happened to have a, a maths teacher who, in fact, um, had done a workshop at uh, Exeter, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the boarding school out in, out in New Hampshire. And uh, he actually recommended it to me and said, look, um, this, uh, this, this school is, uh, is amazing. You know, they have these very unique, uh, methods of teaching, you know, all these advanced subjects. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you could, you could really thrive there. Uh, and, uh, I knew nothing about any of this kind of prep school, private school culture. You know, I'd gone to public school my whole life. Um, but, uh, I was open for the adventure. And I think uh, part of that also kind of goes to the cultural background as well. Uh, having been raised, uh, you know, with, with parents from, from different places, um, they very much encouraged me from a young age uh, to travel, to learn languages. Uh, I had spent, uh, by the time I was, I was 15, I'd spent, you know, the summer in, in Western China by myself mm. uh, and, and different things like that. So I think the idea of, you know, leaving home, uh, going to this, you know, completely foreign environment, uh, New Hampshire, uh, was, uh, was, 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 was just as interesting to me and uh, went there, had, uh, you know, two of the most uh, formative years of my life uh, and then uh, kept, uh, kept traveling and, and exploring more uh, from then. Clearly, uh, dad and mom have uh, given birth to a ocean of curiosity in your case because uh, you were open to traveling, open to new schools, open to new experiences. And how did Africa come out of the map? Great, uh, great question. So interestingly, I actually first started learning Arabic actually at Exeter. So mm. once again, this is one of these opportunities that, you know, at a normal American high school, you're not going to have an yeah. Arabic uh, studies class. But there happened to be uh, an, an instructor, uh, probably my favorite teacher to this day, Mr. Jabari uh -huh. uh, Ustez. And uh, he uh, uh, offered an introduction to, to Arabic class. He's Moroccan, interestingly. Mm and uh, taught actually Spanish, French, and Arabic at the school. They, they really put him to full use. Wow. And uh, so he, uh, he had this, uh, this introduction to Arabic class. And for me, I, I was absolutely fascinated um, because, uh, you know, where else, uh, you know, at, at 17, are you going to have the opportunity to, to kind of study Arabic in, in your high school? Um, and jumped in that, was immediately quite fascinated, uh, you know, with the language itself, which is beautiful, complex, uh, and uh, also, of course, with the culture. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, was particularly intriguing for me, especially, you know, while I was growing up, uh, I think there was a huge amount of ignorance uh, and misunderstanding around the Middle East, uh, obviously still is today, uh, but, but especially then. Um, and, you know, that actually made me more interested in, in the region uh, in, in, in the societies. Uh, and I think that's something that continues to me to this day, which is, you know, the more a place seems to be misunderstood, the more curious I am about it. Mm. Um, and that continued with me uh, into my university studies. Um, so I, I ended up at the, the University of Chicago, um, where I was in fact studying uh, uh, computer science, linguistics, and Middle Eastern studies, uh, wow. which is kind of a strange combination, but- uh, So you uh, also had three majors. Uh, yeah, well, uh, didn't finish any of them, as I'm sure we'll get <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, because uh, we'll get to that, because yeah, you, yeah. you, like Mark, another dropout. Oh, you, yeah, like yeah. Mark and Steve Jobs, so basically, if you want to be a dot com super successful rock star, you have to drop out. 
It's it's a big cliche at this point, <laughs> but uh, at the time, uh, you know, I and and, and to this day, uh, you know, don't don't regret it, nor uh, do do I regret uh, my experience uh, at the University of Chicago either, because without. Uh, uh, those programs from a number of perspectives uh, definitely wouldn't be here today uh, with the company either. Uh, but it was, it was through my uh, initial kind of continuation of studies there, Arabic, that I ended up doing uh, this exchange program, the study abroad program, uh, which brought me to Jordan and, and also to Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, which was the first time that I had actually uh, set foot on, on the, the African, African continent. Um, and actually during uh, that time, uh, that was, in fact, where I was also exposed to the environment that inspired the whole um, uh, innovation behind the company that became Wasoko. Mm. Uh, and so during that period, when I was just living in a normal neighborhood, I got to know some of the small mom and pop stores that are all around and realized that these were kind of very traditional uh, family-run businesses that didn't have any tools or systems uh, to help them manage their store, uh, work with suppliers, uh, or grow uh, their shops. Uh, and because of the tech background that I had as well, always, as I said, very interested in math, sciences. Uh, and once I got to university, got into coding and became particularly intrigued with this idea of using my skills to actually build out systems, solutions that could actually help people and specifically off the beaten path. So once again, this kind of curiosity of, you know, the perhaps lesser known places. Uh, mm. I, have, I have a lot of friends, um, uh, you know, former classmates who yeah, have ended up in Silicon Valley and, you know, they're working for, you know, Google or for some, you know, email content marketing company or Uber for dog walking or whatever, these kinds of uh, businesses. But uh, to me, you know, the, the, the real value and interest is where you can go, you know, slightly off the beaten path to a place that maybe other folks uh, who don't look like me, who don't have my background, uh, who don't have my particular skill set or, 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 or perspective, uh, you know, are, are also living their lives and trying to find ways to improve them. And, you know, by working together, by, you know, bringing the, the, the best from, you know, all environments, uh, can we ultimately uh, create value uh, and create solutions that, you know, help the lives of uh, as many people as possible. Amazing. So in that trip, uh, you eventually finished in Kenya and started your company at what age? Yes. So I arrived in Kenya actually when I was uh, 22. Mm. Uh, so a couple years after the, uh, the, the study abroad in Egypt. Um, and basically what happened in between that was I got the original idea, this initial idea to build out systems tools to support mom and pop stores. I was back in Chicago, actually put together this concept for a business plan competition that mm. the, the university ran, um, uh, wrote up this whole business plan, uh, gave the pitch, uh, was evaluated by you know, all these uh, business school professors and whatnot, and ended up actually winning a prize uh, and a bit of funding. I think it was $10,000. So everything got started with this you know, kind of $10,000 check. And that was actually the excuse that I used to drop out of school. So uh, I, uh, I remember very clearly kind of having the, the, the conversation with my father and basically saying, look, you know, I won this competition, you know, got this, uh, this, the, this $10,000. Uh, and I really believe in this. I really believe that you know, this can be um, you know, a solution, can be a business that can help people. Uh, you know, who needed a lot more than, uh, you know, your average, uh, you know, tech company customers uh, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, he was very skeptical, um, but he said, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm proud of you for when I go out there and actually build something, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, make, make a difference in people's lives. So, you know, you can give it a shot. You're going to be on your own. Like, don't, don't expect me to, uh, you know, kind of to uh, pay your way. To your LP or your GP. Or, uh, exactly, exactly. I'm not going to be Tiger Global. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, you know, made it very clear that, that I needed to figure it out myself, but, uh, you know, did not stand in the way. Uh, and that's something that I think, especially for him, you know, his, uh, his generation, his background um, was a, a very, uh, uh, you know, unexpected 
mm. uh, uh, thing 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 to do. Um, so you know, forever grateful to uh, my parents for uh, giving me that yeah. uh, that space to take a leave of absence mm. uh, uh, that uh, eventually uh, enabled me to to kind of fully fully dedicate myself on this path. Amazing. No kudos to to your parents because it's not an easy as a parent myself. We always wonder what happens a day when the real business plan of the real owner comes up. So that's the toughest part to be a parent. You kind of guide, you find yourself on the wheel, but you often forget that it's not your car. So thumbs up for daddy for realizing that it was time for him to let you drive and sit in the back. And when you created the company, obviously with a lot of success, by age 27 or 28, you're raising a Series A or B, $125 million. What was the cap table membership? It was Tigers Global and who else? So our, our Series B round was uh, co-led by Tiger, Tiger Global, as well as Avenir Growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, uh, fantastic investors, uh, joined by a number of other, uh, fan fantastic, uh, supporters as well. Uh, and the valuation was already over $600 million. Uh, yes. Just over $600 million. Wow. And, uh, and by then, uh, you guys had already reached a revenue run rate of what? Uh, over $200 million in, in, in annualized. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. 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 And then obviously, fast forward, uh, not being willing to be constrained by one market, being a true Daniel that uh, parents from Hong Kong and California find yourself in Kenya. And you and I had a lot of dealings when you're considering buying another company in Nigeria <laughs> and then another one in Ivory Coast. But... The time at the bar, the dating scene was not. You discover that Egypt was the place where you were going to find the marriage material. So tell us about uh, the merger. Absolutely. So as uh, as uh, as you've suggested, uh, you know we've always been looking at. Uh, creative ways to expand and really unlock the pan-African potential that our business, our model, uh, we uh, we very strongly believe uh, can 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 create. And so, you know, Wasoko, uh, even though uh, was initially inspired by my time abroad uh, here in Egypt, we actually got that going. We got that launched in Kenya. Uh, and that was due to the connections and the introductions that I got originally leading me to first uh, establish the commercial partnerships uh, with some of these consumer goods companies uh, in East Africa. And so we built up the business in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and then started looking beyond the East African region at how we could continue uh, to expand our footprint and you know the best way to do that. And in our different discussions, uh, what we realized is that, you know, if we can actually partner up with someone who is a true domain leader uh, in the region as well, that's ultimately going to be what gets us the farthest. Mm. Um, you know, there's the, the, the famous proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go mm. far, go together. Mm. And I think that's absolutely uh, what we saw and in our mission, which is, how do we help as many communities across Africa get more for less? We realized that we needed to combine forces with other regional leaders uh, to really uh, unlock that potential. And so uh, MaxAB, we um, have been very familiar with since we actually both raised our seed rounds back in 2018 mm. from the same lead investor. So 40X Ventures mm. led Wasoko's uh, seed round as well as Max Abs. Uh, and so I got connected with Bilal back then, so over six years ago. Wow. And, uh, you know, realized that we both wanted to build the same thing. Uh, we had the same vision for, for what uh, e commerce and, you know, a tech enabled platform could unlock and create for African mom and pop stores. Um, we were just starting from different regions. So mm. I was in Kenya at that time, Bilal was in Egypt. Um, but we said, hey, you know, we can absolutely learn from each other. We can support each other, uh, share notes. Uh, we even had teams visit each other 
uh, over the over the following years uh, and uh, built up that relationship, built up that trust uh, until uh, finally came to a point last year where we realized, you know what, you know, now is the time. We both kind of reached the pinnacles of our respective regions, and you know, the time to actually go further together. Uh, is now. And so that's what ultimately kind of led to uh, the merger uh, coming together. And uh, yeah, very excited uh, to share that uh, we've just closed it uh, as of a month or so ago. For congratulations. That's been exciting, long time coming and uh, thrilling for all the investors and thumbs up to 40X for being uh, a bit of a mother or dad of uh, the upcoming baby because in this uh, world of uh, VC investing, there's always a lot of debate whether the VCs are adding value or not. I'm sure you are in many of those chat rooms where whether you're in a chat room of founders or a chat room of VCs, the prognosis is not necessarily the same. But in this case, I'm sure that as a founder, you seem to indicate that uh, the, there's a role uh, of value coming from at least the VC circle. I think we've done exceptionally well and, and had, a, had a wonderful cap table. Our early investors going all the way back to the seed, um, which, as I said, 40X led to the, the Series A, which was led by Quona Capital, uh, to the Series B, which, which we talked about. Uh, we, we really have had excellent investor mm -hmm. shareholders uh, throughout the journey who have been very supportive of the vision and, and also helped uh, to you know push back and 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 correct you know when mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe uh, some of the directions or the ideas that we've had uh, you know haven't uh, been uh, you know as aligned with the vision and with the potential that uh, we all see. Um, you know, that, that's really where I think the right balance and the relationship between founders and investors come in. And it's all about, I think, kind of cultivating that trust, that openness, um, and also recognizing what each side is best positioned, best positioned to, do. to contribute, right? So, mm. uh, you know, investors should not be the ones running the business. They shouldn't be coming in, uh, telling us how we should set up our warehouses or anything like that, uh, in the same way. Uh, you know, when it comes to some of these broader ecosystem moves, like, you know, who should we be talking to? Who should we be getting to know as, you know, the next uh, potential M&A targets or partners? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that is really where I think investors who spend the vast majority of their time in that broader ecosystem are much better placed than individual founders uh, to evaluate. And uh, I'm curious to first, super congrats. We're very happy to to have you announce it on the show. And obviously we've seen all the coverage on the news. It's been uh, the biggest deal this year. I think the largest uh, M&A of uh, 2024 currently. And uh, I do not foresee a bigger one. And it's great that it takes uh, different regions and um, get them to collaborate. The continent needs more of it, only more of it. Uh, I'm curious to hear how was your experience dealing with the multi-layer aspect of an M&A for the first time from a founder standpoint. It's something that as a former investment banker and private equity practitioner, it's something that becomes pretty much the kitchen. But I'm sure it must be quite an eye-opener to have the variety of getting the different boards, the different cap tables, different cultures, the different operation layers and architectures to layer up. <laughs> How was that? The merger process overall has been uh, extraordinarily educational uh, and I think quite surprising too in a number of ways. There were, there were areas that went uh, significantly easier than expected okay. and others that went uh, you know, more difficult than expected. And I think what struck me overall as I went through the process is just the complexity of dealing with the number of stakeholders mm. who are involved. Because in your normal uh, venture capital fundraising process where you're raising a, a new round of financing, you're really dealing with, you know, two sets of stakeholders, right? You have the existing shareholder base and really the founder, the existing board, you know, and, and what, um, uh, you know, everybody's aligned, agreed to accept in terms of terms. Then you have the new investor who's coming in and, you know, what they're willing to offer. And, you know, that can be complex enough by itself going back and forth. In the 
uh, merger scenario, you have not only you know the two companies, but actually within each company, the different shareholders and constituencies, you know, the management, the team, the cultures, the, the, cultures, um, the uh, external uh, perception, the different classes of shareholders who, uh, you know, might have different terms or benefits that, 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 that they have uh, in one company. And so figuring out how to align and get everyone on board to accept a given deal or a given structure was uh, an enormously um, uh, intricate process. <laughs> uh, we can imagine. say uh, painful at times, um, but you know I think kind of going layer by layer and starting off first and foremost with the founders, um, I think was uh, the the approach that we took and de definitely the right one. So you know at the at the very beginning of it all. Um, you know, it, 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 and, and at the end really as well is it's, you know, it's me and Bilal and, you know, what is the vision of what we're building? And if that's not aligned, then there's no way that any deal can ever happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, it starts with that and starts with aligning on what is the North star? What is it that we're ultimately creating? And, you know, if that's in place, then all of the other difficult maneuvers, you know, can ultimately be kind of tied back and can be overcome mm -hmm. with that big vision, with that end outcome in mind. But if you don't have that, then, uh, you know, it's not going to be possible. So I think uh, I'm, I'm very, very uh, grateful to, to have a partner like Bilal, who, um, as I said, has absolutely, um, you know, the, the, the same, you know, grand view on the potential of what our Pan-African business can be. Uh, but who at the end of the day is also very complimentary and, and quite different from mm -hmm. me in terms of, uh, you know, what his skill set, his experience, his superpowers are. And I think that's also something that's, you know, made uh, this deal. You know, I mentioned that there are some aspects that uh, actually uh, went uh, better, easier than expected. And, you know, I would actually describe the integration process, you know, bringing the two teams together, the operations, the technology that surprisingly, we managed to fully map out and integrate in under 60 days, wow. which, you know, I think is pretty unheard of uh, at, at, at uh, you know, this kind of size complexity of company. Um, but we were helped very much by the perspective that we, you know, very much were doing the same business. Uh, so operationally, we had the same model working with mom and pop stores uh, to provide them with not only their essential goods to continue selling, serving the community, but also the financial services, the fintech products that we offer as well. So very, very much the same operating model there. Uh, but then also the, the 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 interpersonal alignment, where as I said, you know, we were able to sit down and say, hey, this is the end state of what we want. Uh, you know, everybody has their marching orders. Uh, you know, let's let's make this happen. Um, and execute from there. What didn't necessarily go as easily as expected was all the legal admin process, you know, some of the shareholder management, just Governance. getting all the, all the paperwork, everything. And especially given the footprint, you know, both companies were multinational. Uh, and I think in the combined company, we now have something like 16 different subsidiaries because for each wow. country uh, or in some of the countries, we actually have multiple entities and whatnot as well for the different services and products. Uh, so that uh, I think definitely should not be underestimated in the complexity of pulling off something like this. Today's episode is sponsored by Statement. Statement is a media company focused on editorial coverage and market analysis of the African entertainment industry. Its production arm builds a pipeline for African women filmmakers. Magic Johnson, Samuel L. Jackson, and Latanya Richardson Jackson are among the investors that support the statement's mission. We are big fans. Well, super congrats. And uh, obviously, today, there's a new brand, there's a new name, and always having a baby uh takes labor you know giving birth takes labor so obviously you've told us that the process was not super easy but it was a rewarding one now that the baby is here and each of you had a name what's so cool what did it mean max up what did it mean 
and what's the meaning of the new name and where is it going? You're putting a lot of pressure on us, Ibrahim. <laughs> so we, we are, in fact, uh, working on a new single unified brand identity, mm -hmm. but we haven't actually completed the full okay. brand exploration process okay. as okay. of yet. Okay. However, I think to your point, uh, you know, both companies, both brands, you know, have uh, significant values so, and, and, and history behind them. So uh, Wasoko uh, it comes from the Swahili roots. So Soko mm. actually means market. Okay. Interestingly, originally from the Arabic word souk. Yes, that's so, true. Yeah, so yeah. you have even yeah. these, you know, yeah. Pan-African ties. Uh, and Swahili is like 40 to 60 percent Arabic. Exactly. So you have you have, you know, even just in the, the full histories, you know, across East Africa, North Africa, these deep links that go back centuries. Um, and the, the wa prefix uh, means people. So mm. wasoko. Uh, okay. You can interpret as people of the market. Okay. Um, okay got whereas uh, maksab, uh, the the Arabic uh, word and 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 name of the the company uh, as it was launched uh, in North Africa, uh, means profit. Uh, mm. uh, profit, as in uh, business profits. Wow. Uh, so uh, to to kind of have, have a gain, a benefit for one's business, uh, the maksab. Uh, name really kind of anchors on that. And that's really, if you look at the, the business lines, the, the product portfolio of what the, the company has and, and also what Wasoko was doing, it was all about how do we help that mom and pop store grow their business, increase their profits, their revenues, and wow. better serve their community. Um, so I think both, both names, oh, you know, this have, is great. Uh, yeah. You guys will have a lot of fun in the coming months to weeks because basically between people, market, and profit, they, sh they should be a, a fun baby to come out of it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's what we're working on. This is, this is great. How about uh, the vision ahead? Now that the two entities are merged, the region, the coverage now is how many countries and what's the collective vision in this current stage of tech history, African tech history, and uh, many changes occurring at the same time. The combined company has an active footprint across five different African countries. So Wasoko, uh, Kenya was historically in Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda. Um, Maxab was active in Egypt and Morocco. Um, so the combined company now yeah, has coverage across both East and North Africa. And what I can say is, you know, the, 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 the purpose of this combined company is the same as I think it's been for both sides, um, you know, for many years, which is how do we help communities get more for less across the African continent? Mm -hmm. What I can say though, is what we're seeing now with the combined scale and the, the, the growth of both companies now together as one entity is an evolution beyond what I would describe as what was phase one of our business, which is really the core B2B e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And so that product, that service was enabling the mom and pop shop to use our app and get essential goods, whether that's rice, soap, toilet paper, you name it, delivered for free next day to restock their store. On that e-commerce layer, we've built out this network of over 200,000 mom and pop stores. Mm. What we realized from there is that we can help our shops grow and better serve their community, not just by giving them more and more products that they can order in stock, but actually by adding in digitally enabled services and financial mm. services and products especially to help further unlock the products and their business potential mm. as well. So mm. a good example of that is credit financing. Mm. So of course, these SMEs, these mom and pop stores, they're hugely underserved by the formal financial Just, ecosystem uh, yeah. across uh, these African countries. And so what we've done is using the data and using the, the network built out on the e-commerce side, developed our own in-house credit financing algorithms mm. 
and now financing, mm. whereby we extend working capital to mm. these mom and pop stores mm. based off their activity on the e-commerce side. Mm. And so these shops are able to get access to credit financing for the first time. Mm. And what we see is not only a big increase in the volume of e-commerce purchases that they make with mm. us as a result of getting access to that credit, but also unparalleled repayment of the credit finance. We have repayments of over 99%. Nice, congrats. On this, on this SME financing that we're doing, which is unheard of wow. uh, you know, in the ecosystem. And so I think what it, what it showed to us is that there's a real synergy, you know, the real you know, one plus one is 11 effect in this market of you know, SMEs in Africa is not when you kind of approach every service or every product as a standalone company or as a standalone business but where you can actually combine these different business models together and unlock a lot more because of the existing relationship, the data, the infrastructure that you built out to serve that customer. Mm. And so this is really what we see as the future of, of the combined business, gotcha. which is what product, any product that the African mom and pop store can benefit from for themselves, or to better serve their community, we will offer through the combined company's B2B platform. Mm. So we start off with e-commerce, we're offering now credit financing. We've also launched digital payments, mm. which in different markets is enabling the uh, mom and pop store to have a secure digital wallet where they mm. can uh, keep a balance, keep float, use that to pay for product services from us and even from outside companies as well. Uh, and also uh, digital services, uh, revenue streams, additional mm. business lines that the mm. shopkeeper can use mm. to sell, for example, mobile top-ups to mm. consumers, utility top-ups, um, which give them an additional revenue stream beyond the core consumer goods that oh. they might be trading in right now. So anything that the community can ultimately benefit from through the mom and pop store, we want to unlock, we want to enable through our platform. Fantastic. What, uh, what you've said is very uh, enlightening and may help diffuse some of the misconception that exists in the market. Because if you had to distinguish yourself away from Jumia, Amazon that operates on the continent still, once they purchase soup. Sabi, Omnibis, and obviously former market force, who is now uh, defunct or merged into another vehicle. What would you say are the, the key segment that makes this entity different and stand out? Great question. So I would say it comes down to who is your customer? Hmm. And so in the case of a Jumia or an Amazon, the customer is the consumer. And hmm. really in the African context, the elite or the upper class consumer, okay. because for uh, the average consumer who has maybe you know $5 a day of purchasing power, they're not necessarily going to be able to go online and order for you know, a new gadget mm. or a new uh, uh, wardrobe or something like that, which is what uh, a lot of how Western e-commerce companies like Amazon uh, have uh, monetized and grown their businesses. Um, and so for the vast majority of consumers, their purchasing power is still being done in the local retail businesses like mm. the mom and pop stores that we serve. Mm. And so that's really where the original thesis of saying, where's the purchasing power in Africa today? It's with the neighborhood shops, over $600 billion of uh, essential everyday consumer goods are still being sold through them way more than, you know, in the supermarkets or certainly, you know, online uh, through these, uh, these, these B2C e-commerce channels. Um, and so at that level, where you're talking about how do you get into those supply chains what I've seen is companies who have taken more of an upstream approach where their focus, their customer is the supplier. 
And I think that is definitely what some of these other players, you know, when you're B2B, yes, you're serving both sides, but ultimately you're going to have to focus your innovations, your, 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 your product development. Uh, and, you know, in some cases there's going to be trade-offs between, uh, you know, do you help this B or do you help the other sides be more? Uh, and I think, uh, we've seen, you know, some players kind of focus more upstream on working with the large brands, large companies, and, you know, maybe helping them uh, uh, with certain products, you know, analytics, uh, whatnot. Um, but for us, we're certainly focused on the small B. And uh, that mom and pop store, uh, we have innovated for them, uh, you know, to give an example of where some of these trade-offs come in, but where I think uh, you know, we're really kind of leading the pack and, 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 and using the leverage that we have, uh, you know, to the maximum extent is, uh, we actually have built out a significant private label business now. Mm. And so what we've done is looked at the network of over 200,000 mom and pop store customers that we have. We look at what they're buying. We look at the choices that they have in the different categories, uh, that, uh, that are offered today. And we actually analyze and come up with, huh, okay, this particular product category, it's actually underserved. There are, there are only a few different choices, a few different mm -hmm. brands that are available. And based off the data uh, and, and, and the insights that we have, we realize that, you know what, we can go custom produce, contract manufacturer, wow. um, that product or, 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 or a competing product to help give better selection, better value Amazing. to um, our customers through that. And that part of our business today actually drives over 10% of our e-commerce volume. Wow, boom. And interestingly, under the combined company, we see even more opportunity to drive that because what we realized is with the footprint, we can actually unlock significant intra-Africa trade and exports mm -hmm. by leveraging the origin, best origin places mm. for mm. getting certain types of goods. Mm. So for example, over 90% of Egypt's tea originates from Kenya. Wow. But today in our Egyptian business, we've been buying all of that tea from importers wow. here locally. And so, <laughs> you know, with the combined footprint of the business, <laughs> now that we have deep operations in both Egypt and in Kenya, some cost efficiency right there, we're able to go directly to the source and say, Hey, let's get the tea. Let's, 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 whatever the consumer preference is here in Egypt, we can make sure that we develop that blend, you know, that packaging, that style, that taste profile, get those products produced, packaged at the source in Kenya, export them directly ourselves into Egypt and ultimately provide that at the best value, the best quality possible to our Egyptian customers, you know, here in Cairo and, and across the country. And wow. that's only possible because we have the combined footprint that we now do. Fantastic. I think uh, you guys may even uh, rebrand your activity, r retail commerce intelligence. This is like a form of uh, artificial intelligence base for the B2B. Well, no, that, that, that's phenomenal. Uh, really thumbs up for that. And definitely it's clear that you guys are, are striving. Having that coverage is only going to permit you to be better, more dominant and more salient in your actions for the benefit of the retailers. We will now double click back to a segment of you in Kenya. We hear that you used to be in a band, music band. Tell us about that time. You're, uh, you've, done, you've done your homework. So I, uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, in a band, uh, the Beat Hogs, uh, Beat Hogs. as we were called. Um, uh, still going today. Unfortunately, I've uh, I had to sub out uh, as I've shifted <laughs> up here to, uh, uh, to Egypt. But uh, the Beat Hogs, uh, uh, I believe, were East Africa's uh, uh, best, uh, but probably only uh, funk cover band. Uh, and so, yeah, I was playing, playing the keys, uh, playing, uh, playing piano, uh, along with, uh, nine other people, uh, in the band. So we were proper wow. big sized, uh, funk, uh, funk disco group. And, uh, yeah, we had a blast, uh, playing, playing around all the top spots in Nairobi, uh, did weddings, birthdays, wow. special occasions. So, uh, so you must know Peng. 
Yes, yes, very much, very much. So uh, we were we were regulars uh, at the Alchemist at his uh, at his joint uh, in Nairobi. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, and it was a, a fun uh, uh, kind of double life to have. You know, sometimes I'd be out uh, playing a gig, uh, and then uh, you know I'd have people come up to me who I knew from the from the tech world and say, <laughs> "What are you doing back there?" <laughs> That's amazing. Well, with that music experience, then you can answer easily these personal questions. So we're going to close out with uh, a bit of personal um, of you. So if you had to pick a chief orchestra, a maestro of your life, who would that be? If you had to pick a pianist, one that really provides the regularity of the melody, who would that be? And then if you had to pick a uh, Percussionist, the drummer, who would that be? Because you've had a very busy, multi continent, multilingual life, but who are those mentors, reference, guides? Wow, it's quite a quite a ensemble to to, to put together here. Um, let me uh, let me put this together. I'd say um, as far as the, uh, the drummer, uh, you know, who's, who's been, uh, you know, keeping me on track, uh, driving, driving the beat, uh, making sure that, that, that things, uh, stay, uh, stay consistent. I definitely say that's, uh, it's my new partner, Bilal. Um, right. so, uh, as mm, I said, you know, nice. he's, he's really, uh, uh, really a rock you know he's 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 a hustler he's he's you know unflappable basically you know nice. uh, all the fires that come up uh you know i uh i i've uh you know been through a lot as as uh as you said you know with him over the past uh close to a year or so and i can say that uh uh you know, I think with uh, with most anyone else, uh, who knows? You know, it might not have been possible to to get through this, but I Beautiful. think both of us, as I said, having the shared vision, having the 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 kind of cool under pressure mm. um, personality, uh, I think has been essential through this. And uh, going forward, uh, couldn't couldn't be more excited to be working with anyone else uh, to, to to grow the business. Um, you know, who's the who's the pianist? Who's providing the the accompaniment, the melody? Uh, I would have to say that's uh, that's my fiance. All right. Uh, so uh, she always uh, keeps it interesting. Uh, is not uh, not afraid to to call me out uh, to uh, uh, to you know help flesh out the vision for what life should be, where we're going, uh, what we're what we're doing together, mm -hmm. um, and. On the conductor side, I would say, um, you know, it's been, uh, you know, quite a, a chaotic period uh, over the past year or two. So I feel like we've been somewhat, uh, 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 you know, leaderless, uh, or at least that's the, the feeling I've had, you know, on occasion where it's like, wow, you know, having to kind of figure out where we are in the music in any uh, given point in time. But you know, if I had to attribute maybe at least a, a composer, you know, someone who, who helped to kind of write the script or, or at least set out the, the notes uh, for where I found myself in now, uh, I would have to call out my uh, good friend and mentor, uh, Raghu, uh, who uh, was actually uh, one of our earliest investors uh, mm. as well. And uh, so he's actually uh, today a professor. At the, mm. at the University of Chicago. Wow. And uh, he was actually the one who uh, first got me into coding. Wow. Um, so sent me down the, uh, the, the tech journey. Uh, he himself uh, was actually a, a successful overseas entrepreneur as well. Um, uh, started uh, some successful businesses in India uh, before coming back to the US and uh, uh, kind of building out uh, his current career uh, uh, teaching coding and, and, and working, uh, with, uh, with students there. And, uh, yeah, uh, I would say that that really kind of opened up my eyes to how technology and entrepreneurship, uh, could really be uh, transformative. 
And, wow. Uh, yeah, I think phenomenal it's a group. group. Phenomenal group. Really, uh, blessing. The blessing is everywhere. It's key to be able to face it, recognize it, and move on with it. So that's 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 superb. In terms of what has shaped you, you've given us some clear guidance. Where are you going? You've given us clear guidance. In terms of um, your past, if you can, on the spot, think about the kindest thing someone has done for you, what would come to mind? The, the kindest thing that immediately comes to mind for, for, for what has ever been done for me is actually when a, a Buddhist monk bought me lunch while I was on a bus backpacking through Tibet. Wow. So I was uh, 18 years old, uh, traveling across uh, rural China uh, and had uh, kind of found my way uh, into, this was a, it was a four day bus ride. Uh, so, uh, for, uh, uh, adventure travel, definitely, uh, that's about as, uh, <laughs> as, as rough as it gets. Um, and, uh, I found myself, uh, seated next to this, this monk, uh, who, uh, was, uh, extremely generous. And, uh, during, uh, uh, one of our rest stops, uh, lunch, lunch stops on one of these days, uh, bought me this uh, enormous bowl of uh, beef noodles after I don't think we'd had a proper meal for at least 24 hours or so. <laughs> and uh, the fact that he paid, I, I still feel bad about that. Uh, I, 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 at the time I was like, no, I should, I should be the kid. Uh, I should be paid, you know, uh, all this, but he, he absolutely refused. And so uh, I hope to pay forward that, uh, that act of kindness and that spirit of generosity uh, in, in my life uh, generally wow. and, and to come. Oh, that's beautiful. It's kind of you to share and uh, rich of you to remember because those moments make us and continue to translate through our actions. So really thumbs up for, for that. And you to leave you, I just want to hear what is your singular biggest guess as to how AI could change your industry, your wildest guess in two sentences. I would say that AI will change the back end for how a business like ours is optimized, is operated. However, it will not fundamentally disrupt what it means to be a mom and pop store in the African context. The, the need to have that physical touch point that that family run business in the community that's not going anywhere and so from my perspective the whole opportunity with ai as we're using it today to optimize our demand planning to optimize our product development to optimize our 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 routes uh deliveries warehouses all of that it's all about how does that ultimately translate to better products, better services, better livelihoods for our customers and for their community. And, you know, there's uh, AI uh, can't, uh, can't distribute rice uh, to, 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 to a single mother who has two children to feed. You know, she still is going to need to be able to go to the shop down the street and, uh, and, and, and buy that rice to, uh, to cook for a family tonight. So I think, uh, it's, it's going to transform an enormous number of things uh, upstream and, uh, and, and definitely have a lot of positive optimizations for uh, how we run our business. But I think the core need of getting food on everyone's table, getting products into local communities, uh, that's not going anywhere. Hey, Daniel, thanks a lot for the gift of your time. This was enlightening. As always, super pleasure, pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me. Hey, if you like today's story, press like, leave a comment, subscribe, come back for more stories from founders and funders changing the face of sports, tech, entertainment, and fashion from Africa to the rest of the world. We look forward to seeing you again soon.